So in this last video for, to, for today, we're going to be talking about the cytoskeleton. And we've talked about... So in this last mini lecture, we're going to be talking about the cytoskeleton. So this is, plays an important role in eukaryotic cells. And it is... So in this last video, we're going to be talking about a really important protein network inside eukaryotic cells called the cytoskeleton. So I'm going to begin by defining what the cytoskeleton is. It's a dense, dynamic, and complex network of protein fibers. So the, there's a lot of cytoskeletal proteins in cells. They're constantly rearranging and they interact with one another. And they function in maintaining the shape of cells. They function in helping cells move. So that means either intracellular movements, so moving around their organelles, like they may want to divvy up their organelles when the cell divides, or moving along in their extracellular environment by crawling. And not all cells do this, but some cells do. The cytoskeleton plays a really important role in cell division, and we'll talk about how it, how the, how microtubules help separate chromosomes. It functions in cell contraction, like in muscle cell contraction and in cytokinesis, and it mediates the interaction between cells. So we're going to talk a little bit about how the cytoskeletal network does this. But I'm going to introduce the three types, the three principal types of protein filaments or types of cytoskeletal proteins. And those are actin filaments, which are sometimes called microfilaments because they were the smallest of the filaments. We then have the intermediate filaments and we have lastly microtubules. And I'm going to talk about each three of these in succession. And I want you to be able to explain what they're made of how they polymerize, so how they bind to one another, and what they do, or a few things that they do. So the first one we'll talk about are actin filaments. Actin makes up about one to 5% of all the total protein in a cell, and about 20% of all protein in a muscle cell. And here's my cartoon schematic of what actin looks like. Sometimes we call the individual monomer, we call it G-actin for globular actin. And actin binds to ATP. And the ATP is important for its ability to polymerize into a filament, as shown here. And sometimes we call this filament F-actin or filamentous actin. And what you can see is that each monomer attaches to the next monomer and attaches to the next monomer. And the first one that attaches down here, the next one to attach, this has ATP and gradually that ATP becomes hydrolyzed so that there's more ADP on this end than there is ATP on the, the end that's growing the quickest. Now you can get these actin filaments growing in a chain and they wrap around each other. And this single wrapping here it's approximately six nanometers. And this is the smallest in diameter. This is six nanometers, these two wrapping around each other of all the three filaments. New monomers can get added at either end. So they can get added at the minus end or the plus end, but the growth preferentially happens at this plus end. And it has to do with this ATP um, actin being still not hydrolyzed at this site. So it'll grow a lot more quickly from this plus end. And there's a lot of actin in the cell, but not all of it is filamentous actin. There's a balance between G actin and F actin. And there's a lot of actin binding proteins we won't have time to talk about that regulate when actin polymerization is gonna happen and in what direction that polymerization occurs. So what does actin do? And I'm a little biased because one of the processes I study requires actin. And so I think actin filaments are the coolest. So one of the things that actin does is it helps with cell crawling. And so we have a picture of a cell here. And this is a, I think this is a fibroblast cell. And what this cell is doing is it's crawling, okay? And cells crawl in a direction. So here's this cell body. 
and the cell makes these protrusions and these protrusions are called lamellipodia. You don't have to know these words and you have this leading edge, which is essentially an arm reaching out if you can anthropomorphize the cell and grabbing onto something. And then the rest of the body, the rest of the cell will contract and it'll be dragged along, it'll crawl along. And so actin is important for reaching out and contracting and pulling the cell forward by reaching. I have a video here. This is a video showing the role of actin in amoeboid movement. Amoeba proteus, a freshwater protist, crawls via amoeboid movement. And so we didn't movement. get to see these in lab, Extensions but these are really cool structures. And this amoeboid movement similarly it requires actin. And you can see it kind of propelling it, its body the forward. The and all of the organelles are moving forward with this liquid. Organelles. And that's that requires the actin. And it is um, instead of calling actin. the leading edge, it's called a pseudopodium. So just different words for different organisms. Okay, the next video I wanna show you is this one video that I made a while ago when I was a postdoctoral research fellow at um, the University of Iowa. And we had this really cool machine that let us image crawling cells. And so these are neutrophils from a human. And what this is is there's this little shelf here and you put the cells in this well here and they have to crawl, they have to squeeze under the shelf and um, and then they can move, but they're not going to squeeze under this, this shelf unless there's some sort of signal. So over here in this well, we put what we call a chemoattractant. This is a chemical that attracts um, our white blood cells. So this was, it was called FMLF, it's part of bacteria and our white blood cells can sense this and if they sense it they can start crawling towards that signal and so i'll play this video it's pretty cool so we put the cells in this well and then we put the chemical in and we start recording and so you can see a lot of the cells just crawling right under that barrier and going to the chemical right so most of the movement is this way obviously there's a few confused people and then these guys are eat, attempting to eat something down here. But it happens, we sped this up, but it happens pretty fast. And so this is what's happening in your body when you get an infection. And it's all mediated by this really cool um, actin polymerization in this particular direction. And the last one I'll show you is, this is a really neat um, experiment done by the Heinrich lab. And they have these, they call them molecular tweezers. And so what they can do is they can hold on to a white blood cell. This here is a neutrophil, just like in the last video, but they can hold on to it with this little pipette tip. That's what they call the molecular tweezer. And what they've done in this, in this video, and it's a pretty fast video, is that they put on this little bead and this little bead is covered with antibody. And so antibodies are like salt and pepper for our, for our white blood cells. They make, if they're coated on something, the white blood cells are just gonna gobble it right up. So they've went ahead and put the, the antibody on that bead and then they've, they're gonna feed it to this neutrophil that they're holding on to. Okay, so we got to see some really cool videos of neutrophil crawling and phagocytosis and amoeboid crawling. We're gonna talk just real briefly about some other functions for actin that require a motor protein. So what a motor protein does is it attaches something like a vesicle um, or a part of the membrane to an actin filament or to a cytoskeletal fil filament. And the motor protein for actin or that interacts with actin is called myosin. And myosin has two important domains. It has a head domain shown here. And this is the part that binds to actin and essentially walks along the actin road. And this part of the protein, it binds to ATP. And every time myosin takes a step, it hydrolyzes ATP. And so this is why when in this example here where we have myosin binding to um, muscle fibers and leading to contraction. Every time you get a contraction, that's gonna require quite a bit of ATP. The other important part to myosin proteins is its tail. And this is what gives each myosin specificity. 
because the myosin's will, tail binds to different cargo. In this case, it's binding to the cell membrane or it's binding to muscle fibers or um, parts of the plasma membrane that are involved in cytokinesis. And in this last example here, it's binding to an organelle. So there's around 20 different kinds of myosin molecule or myosin proteins. I'm showing you the three um, most important ones, um, but they all play a really important role in processes like cell contraction, organelle transport, as well as cytoplasmic streaming. And you may have seen some cytoplasmic streaming take place when you were looking at the chloroplasts moving around um, in the Elodea plants in the lab. So myosin will move along the actin filaments, but myosin can only move towards the plus end. And so that's another reason why that plus end, the one that grows preferentially, is important to point out. So we're gonna um, start talking now about intermediate filaments. These are intermediate in diameter compared to actin filaments and microtubules. And many different types exist and each consists of a different subunit. So essentially the monomer here would be just an, an IF protein. And so humans have approximately 70 different IF genes, okay? And they all, the, a single gene will make a protein and then that protein will form a fiber. And so here's an example of just one protein, one protein fiber made up of an intermediate filament. But this doesn't really help with the intermediate filaments function. And so what happens is another fiber is made and they wrap around each other to form a dimer. This would be a quaternary structure. But this doesn't end there because it pairs up with another dimer to form a tetramer. And there's a lot of uh, molecular interactions that happen between these two dimers that form a stronger filament and then they can interact with more. And so this provides more and more structural support. So the main role of intermediate filaments is to protect against mechanical stress. And so they serve as a protective role. So some examples of intermediate filaments are keratin proteins, and these can be found in the skin, the GI tract, the tongue, cornea, hair, nails, and feathers. And they can provide a lot of structural support to those tissues. The other really important intermediate filament is nuclear lamins. And so recall when we were talking about the nucleus, we said it was made up, it had a nuclear envelope around it. So it had a double membrane around it. So under the nuclear envelope is, the, is a whole bunch of nuclear lamins that form this network of filaments under the nuclear membrane. And so this, gives, this helps the nucleus maintain its, its shape and also chromosomes bind to the intermediate filaments and kind of these anchor the chromosomes. And at really important times in the cell, those chromosomes can detach from the intermediate filaments. And this might happen in the process of um, repl DNA replication or in cell division. So the final micro or the final cytoskeletal protein we'll talk about are microtubules. So microtubules are the largest of the cytoskeletal elements. And this monomer is actually a dimer of two proteins. And those two proteins are alpha tubulin and beta tubulin. Now, instead of binding to ATP to get their energy for polymerization, these monomers bind to GTP. And so this is another um, structure in the cell or another chemical compound in the cell, I guess I should call it a compound, um, that looks a lot like ATP. It has those phosphate bonds and that can provide energy um, for polymerization to happen. So we have this, um, this dimer here and these dimers essentially form one long strand, okay? And we call that one long strand of alternating alpha and beta tubulin we call that a protofilament. And 13 protofilaments wrap around each other, shown here, and this forms a hollow tube. And so this is approximately 25 nanometers in diameter. So pretty big when you think that, that actin is only six nanometers in diameter. So these are much bigger structures. 
And like actin, they have directionality and they're highly dynamic. So they're always polymerizing and depolymerizing. And they have a plus end and a minus end. So this end where there's where the um, the monomers have just added, usually GTP hasn't been hydrolyzed yet. And so this end, this plus end will grow faster. And then at this back end where GDP, um, where the GTP has been hydrolyzed, it will grow more slowly. And this directionality, it's just important because we're going to talk in a little bit about how motor proteins move and they have, they like to move towards either the plus end or the minus end in microtubules. So what do microtubules, well, let's first talk about how microtubules are built. So microtubules have to arise from a microtubule organizing center or an MTOC. And so here's a cell and we have this um, in animal cells, we have, we call our MTOC, our microtubule organizing center, we call it a centrosome. And if we zoom in on the centrosome, the, so this structure here, in fact, what we would see is a bundle of microtubules. And this bundle of microtubules we call centrioles. And so from this bundle of microtubules, right, the centrioles, we form the centrosome. And then from the centrosome, we can are is how our microtubules will grow from this um, from this location, and then out towards the periphery of the cell. So it's just good to get, keep track of these terms now, because as we talk about cell division, these terms may come up again. So during cell division, our centrosomes are duplicated, and so what this helps do is it eventually it's going to help physically separate or pull apart the chromosomes because each microtubule organizing center will have microtubules originating from, of, from it. Some of them will make contact with the chromosomes and then begin to pull those chromosomes back to what, what will be eventually a daughter cell. So microtubules function in cell division. They also function in organelle transport. And so this requires motor proteins. So the motor proteins we're going to talk about here are kinesin and dynein. So let's talk about kinesin first. Kinesin, right, has a tail, and that tail attaches to the cargo. In this case, the cargo is a vesicle or an organelle. And then it has the head groups. And the head groups will hydrolyze ATP. And dyne, or kinesin walks towards the plus end of microtubules. And every time it takes a step, it's going to hydrolyze ATP. So it's going to step, 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 and walk towards that plus end, carrying that vesicle where it needs to go. Microtubules also have a motor protein that move towards the minus end. And that motor protein is dynein. And so this one, again, hydrolyzes ATP as it takes a step, and it moves its vesicle towards the minus end. And so I can, I sometimes can remember this, that dynein moves to the minus end because di is something I associate with being negative and that moves towards the negative end. And kinesin, I think of kinetic energy and that's kind of a positive thing. So I think of kinesin moving towards the plus end. But what I'm going to show you here is a really cool experiment where um, they took these squid axons, which are filled with cytoplasm, and they squeezed it out um, onto a glass cover slip. And so what they're gonna see is that microtubules are gonna form. And when you add ATP, which is gonna activate the motor protein, you will see the organelles in the cytoplasm start to move along in both directions, move along this, the, this microtubule. So it's pretty cool. In this experiment, a cell homogenate containing many different organelles so there's the is organelle. added to microtubules. Motor proteins are normally attached to the organelles. When ATP is added as a fuel for the motor proteins, some organelles bind microtubules. So now and ATP is going to be added by their motors. Most kinesin motors move towards the plus end of microtubules. Kinesin moves it towards the plus end. Dynein motors and then always goes move dynein in the opposite moves it direction. back the other way. Both motors are used to transport organelles, and occasionally a single organelle which must have both types of motor attached, can be seen to switch directions. The bidirectional traffic observed here is reminiscent of that in an intact cell. 
organelles, right? So a single organelle can have both kinesin and dynein on it, and that can help it change direction. So to summarize, there are three types of filaments found in the cytoskeleton. Those are actin filaments, which can also be called microfilaments. These are the smallest. They're made up of actin subunits. They have directionality, so they have a minus end and a plus end. They have a motor protein called myosin that moves along the actin filament towards the plus end. These proteins, these filaments play a very important role in maintaining cell shape, in moving cells via muscle contraction or cell crawling. They help cells, animal cells divide in two and they can move organelles in the cytosol in plants and fungi and in animals. They also contribute to cytoplasmic streaming. And as you saw in this video, they contribute to phagocytosis. The next group of filaments is the intermediate filaments. These are made up of a single subunit that's wound into a dimer. And then those dimers interact with other dimers to form tetramers. We talked about keratin and lamin as examples of the intermediate filaments. Keratins play a really important role in maintaining cell shape, and nuclear lamins help maintain the shape of the nucleus, anchor the nucleus, and anchor the chromosomes to the nucleus. Finally, we talked about microtubules. These are made up of alpha and beta dimers, and they assemble into protofilaments that form a tube that's 25 nanometers in size. These have directionality. They have a minus end and a plus end. So just to recap, actin filaments and microtubules have directionality, but inter intermediate filaments do not. Microtubules have two motor proteins. They have kinesin that moves towards the plus end and dynein that moves towards the minus end. Microtubules help maintain cell shape. They help move flagella and cilia. This isn't something that I talked about in this video, but microtubules are important for, for flagella to beat as well as cilia. So we have cilia on the cells of our respiratory tract, and these are constantly beating to basically keep away bacteria from colonizing. And so microtubules are important for that, the motion of those structures. Microtubules help move chromosomes during cell division. They assist with the formation of the cell plate during plant cell division. They move organelles and they provide tracks for intracellular transport. So these proteins are really cool and I hope you enjoyed the videos and I'll see everyone in class. Thanks, bye.